Welcome to the Startup Grind. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see so many of you, so many people which I haven't met before, and I've got the, uh, had the privilege to meet you. So I'm quite honored to meet so many, so many with such a variety of backgrounds as well. So thank you all for coming. So I'll just say a few things about uh, what Startup Grind is. The Startup Grind is an international network for entrepreneurs, and we are in over 120 countries now, and we are globally sponsored by Google for, for Entrepreneurs, which they provide us with resources and uh, other things as well. Um, what we do, we, we are here to help entrepreneurs with their journeys, with their startups, and uh, every month we have an event and we try and connect as many people as possible. Either by inspiring them with a great speaker, like the one we've got tonight, which I'm sure everyone will be quite uh, amazed uh, by his background story, which uh, I am already. Um, I've known John for quite some time, so I'm quite looking forward to that. Okay, so <laughs> um, just a big shout out to Colombia tonight. So Mauricio Duque in Colombia, in Barranquilla, welcome to Startup Rhymes. I look forward to, speak to speaking to you very soon, and uh, good luck for, for tomorrow. So uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. I think you've got a uh, full house already. So looking forward to watch your video as well. And we will speak it. So for tonight here in Cardiff, beautiful Cardiff. It's not as sunny as it was a, a few weeks ago, but uh, that doesn't make any difference, you know, because people are fantastic. So we've got uh, John Kirkley tonight as a house speaker. He's got a wealth of experience and uh, so much experience in terms of what he's done in the past, different backgrounds in terms of the subjects as well, which includes digital marketing. Um, he's one of, uh, he's been nominated as one of the best entrepreneurs in the UK in the top 30 by CTAM, which I'm sure he'll tell us all about that. Um, and John, he's been around for years and years, and uh, he's also a non executive I've been seven years old. <laughs> I, I didn't mean that like that. <laughs> but uh, he, he's, uh, I think he, he's got roles as non exec and chair as well. So he can advise any startup, any business. And, uh, and that's why his story is so inspiring to all, anyone even watching the video as well. So without further ado, can we please stand up as in tradi traditionally in Startup Ryan and welcome our fantastic speaker for tonight, John Courtney. Welcome, John. So how are you feeling? Well, I'm slightly nervous now. Are you? Uh, <laughs> for people, then there's a big crowd, but you give me a big build-up, so I'm just true. No, no, I'm always, uh, you know, we have to make people um, remember, you know, the, the, you know, how rich background people have, and how you have helped people, for, even by coming here tonight, you are helping people. So thank you for that. Um, so perhaps we'd like no, we'll, maybe we can start by saying you know, a, few, a few things just to get people familiar with John, um, and especially people which haven't met John before. So perhaps could you tell us where you were born and um, so we can start from, from there. Well, back in 1887. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, born in Huddersfield, <coughs> excuse me, Huddersfield, New Yorkshire, uh, but lived in London, went to school in London. Um, and uh, my parents uh, were, were both teachers and writers um, and they emigrated out to Canada in 1967 well that is almost 1887 um, and uh, my, my, my father got a, a, a job as a professor in the university uh, out in Victoria um, on Vancouver Island so we all emigrated out there as a family. I was 10, 10 11. Um, and uh, so I was in school in Canada for five years. Um, and came back at 15 um, and went to boarding school uh, over here. Um, sorry. 
Yeah. Oh, just, um, you know... Um, I could run off forever, I kind of know the subject. You know, <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> so, um, uh, the reason you came to Britain was because of the school? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, education in Canada, um, I thought was fine. It was, it was great, but um, uh, my parents thought English school was uh, a little bit better. Um, and uh, I was probably <coughs> a little bit of trouble at home. So, it, it, was, uh, it kind of suited that's um, so, and um, from then you went to, did you go to university over here? Or? Yeah, um, so I um, uh, went to uh, University of Kent at Canterbury. Uh, I remember going into my, um, my careers master, so this was what, in the 70s. Um, and I, I had not a clue what to do. In those days, business degrees were, 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 were done at um, polys. Technics. It wasn't a university course at all, so that wasn't an option. Um, and my careers master said, "Well, you've got to go into something general, go into law." So I quite like the idea of law. I, I, I'd seen Perry Mason and, and, and these sort of things. I thought well, that sounds quite fun. So I went and did law. And um, the first year, first year was 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 great fun. There was a um, foundation course with seven different subjects and only one of them was law and that was criminal law and that was all about poisoning people and stabbing people and all this sort of stuff. It was great, I really enjoyed it, it was fabulous. And then the second year came and it was all law. And I remember I remember falling asleep um, in constitutional law. I had this huge textbook and my head hit the hit the textbook as I fell asleep. I thought I can't do this anymore. Oh, it's a shame, I, you know, I fancy myself as a barrister, here, but um, um, I, I, in, in, the, in the holidays, because both of my parents have been writers, um, we always had typewriters, so I could, I could type, um, and I could type about 40 words a minute. I looked at the keys, I could type. And um, so I used to get uh, I used to get a holiday job as, um, a, as a typist, sometimes as a receptionist, Sometimes with the switchboard, but, but generally around time. Uh, which is great, We've got good holiday in it. Um, and uh, in between school and university, I, I've, I've worked for a trading company um, as a temporary secretary for a week. And I loved it. The guy was buying and selling chemicals and pharmaceuticals. He was a container of aspirin, and he was buying it in Hamburg and shipping it to Rotterdam, and buying it in Rotterdam and shipping it to, to Antwerp. And it was making money out of, out of thin air. You never saw the product, it was only just here. And I got, I got hooked by it, it was wonderful. Buying and selling, it was brilliant. Do you mind just shut the door? But it's mm. nice. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we have to do this. Oh, uh, it was a it was a challenge. So, uh, so, so I did that. Um, just, just for a week, and when, my, when I fell asleep at, over my law books, um, the guy offered me a job. He said, you know, come and learn to be a trader. Um, and, and so I suspended my degree uh, and went to work as a chemical trader. 76, 77, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, I never went back, I never went back to university. So I'm a university dropout. Um, as a lot of entrepreneurs, I think are. Um, I never went back. I would have done if there'd have been an interesting degree. But today, I think if I would have done business, I would have. I probably would have stayed because that's that's fascinating. But um, law, I'm afraid not. So I went to work as a chemical trader, and I did that for a few years, um, and it was fascinating, buying and selling and trading and um, buying for stock and selling for stock and. You learn lots and lots of business skills. How to negotiate was the, the fundamental one. Paperwork associated with it. Um, I learned not to. There's no accountant in the room. I learned not to trust accountants terribly much um, because the accountant said that, that we. Sorry, we didn't. He lost an accountant. We, we, but the accountant told us we'd lost money in about the third year that I was there. But I knew we hadn't lost the money, um, and. Uh, but uh, but they they decided uh, the owners decided that the accountants were right and 
um, and, and the company didn't, didn't exist after a while. Um, so I went in and, and, and set my own business up. And that was, that was the beginning. Um, so I was 21 um, uh, with my own business. I thought, the world, the world was made. My own business at 21. Nobody told me what hard work it was going to be running a business. Jeez. Here we are 40 years later and I kind of know how much hard work it is. It's quite fun being an entrepreneur, it's bloody hard work. You really? find it by not knowing that was a good way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because yeah. if you've known uh, the stresses and strains and, and heartbreak, would you go into it? Mm, don't know, some would, some wouldn't. Um, there's been lots of great things, don't get me wrong. Um, but it is hard work. And, and any businessman, I meet a lot of uh, business people, a lot of entrepreneurs, and um, you know, first thing I do if they said they've been trading for five years and they're profitable is I shake their hand. I don't know it's hard to work, can you? So, um, so, that, so I, my first business was chemical trading, and um, I remember we got an office in Bristol. Uh, this is 79, I think, something like that. Uh, and I remember I, I wallpapered the, 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 the office. Um, and I painted the skirting board and I did everything. Um, and, you know, kind of made it home. And it was cheap and cheerful, and, 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 but we made a bit of money. Um, I was quite good at trading. Um, I learned a few things along the way. Um, and so we, we ran a trading company for a while. And then I kind of got to, so that was 21, I did that for maybe three years. Um, and actually I found managing people very difficult. Um, I had no training, no experience, uh, and we didn't have very many staff, but I, I did find managing people quite difficult. Um, and uh, so I then went and worked for a PLC. Start up to a PLC in one, one jump. Um, farming company, uh, name of Velcourt, uh, biggest farmers in, in the UK, still are. Um, and I went to work as their um, uh, raw materials manager. So I was their buyer, I'd go and buy their chemicals and fertilizers, and in the end, the, the combine harvesters and tractors, and you name it, you know, 25,000 acres of a huge farming organization. Um, and then that developed into, because we were buying so well, other farmers would ask us and, and we'd go and sell to them. So we had a trading company. Um, and I was back on home, home turf, buying and selling. Um, and uh, I, I, I did that within the group for a while. Uh, and then outside the group, um, as things developed, um, um, I, I had my own um, uh, chemical trading company. Started going to branding then, um, so we had our own, own brand, we weren't just training other people's brands. Uh, and that kind of introduced me to branding proper. Um, and we were selling to agricultural merchants. So I was buying uh, the chemicals and bagging it and branding it, um, and then going to see agricultural merchants and persuading them to buy my product. And I think that's the first time I ever and got a real buzz from, you know, I'd invent, not invented the product, but I'd, I'd invented the brand, and people were buying my brand, and that was, that was quite a new experience, really. Um, Do you feel more responsibility? Or? Yeah, it's more responsibility, and I, I guess more proud that I didn't, mm. not, not I invented something, else, but I created a brand, and people were buying that brand, and that was and I remember having the, the labels, the product labels, up on my office wall. And I'd look proudly at those because I'd, I'd actually the designs were great, but I'd designed them um, and people bought the product. I thought, it's wonderful. Um, and that kind of got me on, 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 on to branding, really. Um, so this was a. Were you in your 30s at that time? When no, I was still late. Where yes, I suppose late twenties at, at, at that stage, like yeah, you know, late twenties. Okay. Yes. And then did you stay within branding, or did you? Well, yeah. So, so, so that company went quite well. Um, I've been very lucky. I've had six 
businesses over the years, um, and, and five have made money, one didn't. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, uh, but but that made some money, not 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 billions, but it, but but enough. And um, uh, but I got bored. One of the entrepreneur's problems is 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 a is a is a pretty terrible boredom threshold. Um, and and I did get bored. Um, I got, and, and because uh, because my hobby, my life is is around cricket. That's what I am. I, I'm, a, I'm an amateur cricketer. Um, and uh, a friend of mine in my cricket club uh, mentioned to me that the best bat maker in the world had gone bust. You know, John Uber, and Uber bats. And uh, I said, that's terrible, that's terrible, we should, we should do something about that. So we did. And we created a, a cricket bat company. And I was running my uh, chemical business, um, and in the spare room, we had a cricket bats. And then we had pads, and then we had some clothing, and eventually the, the room was a bit full, really, all these samples and, and, and things we'd, we'd invented. And I was getting bored with the chemicals, so uh, by then I had a, had a junior partner, and uh, so I sold the business to the junior partner. And um, I put all the money that I made into, into cricket bats. And, um, Proceeded over the next seven years to lose all of that money and a great deal more besides. Um, but it was it was the most fabulous business ever, which was exciting for you. Oh my God, yes! Because suddenly I, I had I was creating a brand again. Yeah. Uh, so I created into a brand of cricket bats and people bought them and pads and gloves and shoes and, and they bought the brand and that was absolutely but that was a question. Ooh, do you think that's a I think doing something you love, as you say, is a, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's mm. You have a passion for it, mm. but, but it's always a good idea. You know, you look at other other businesses, even big businesses like Triumph Motorcycles, yeah. resting on their laurels, but somebody else coming in as an entrepreneur yeah. and taking it over and making decent motor motorcycles but using the brand. Yeah. Um, you can turn the company around by, by actually not being too interested in the product. I, th I think that's a, a dangerous thing to be. It is, product. it is, and I think you may make a really good point. I think you make, if, if it's something you're really passionate about, it, and for me, you know, cricket is... But if it overrides the business? Yes, yes. You, you, kind of, you, you can sometimes make emotional decisions instead of logical decisions. And I certainly fell into that trap a few times. I fell into lots of other traps as well because because I was in the cricket club and then I'd get some of my mates in the cricket club to be working in the business. So that's track number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try not to employ your friends and, and, and relatives. Um, so, and, and then I got my wife involved in the business so there's a friend and a relative and, and a hobby. So I, did, I probably made all, all the mistakes all at once. Um, unsurprisingly, the business never made any money. Um, and, and so we ran it for seven years and every year it lost money. Um, and it was a wonderful business, don't get me wrong, people bought the brand and it, um, we had, uh, you probably don't know, but, but we had our 15 minutes of fame as Andy Warhol said, so we, so we in, invented a double-sided cricket bat and, and it got on the front page of the Times and the Telegraph on the same day. Um, and, you know, we were on the television and the radio and newspapers and, and, and everybody was talking about the company, it was wonderful. And it launched the company, and it got us known, and it got us um, established, and it was wonderful. Still, never made any money. Um, so, who was funding the business? You, as me, out of, your yeah, out of my previous. And, and, and I did. We'll come on Q and after. Sorry, yeah, sorry. sorry. That's clever. So, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, great show, great show. Um, and no matter how how I try to remodel the business. I mean, I talk now, I've talked now this evening to people about, you know, playing with the Rubik's Cube of business and how you can make things more profitable or less profitable by changing things. Um, and I still find that absolutely fascinating. But I did that with the cricket business so many times in order to try and make it profitable. And I never could. Um, and in the end, I had to give up. It was either remortgage the house or, which my wife wouldn't let me, or, 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 or 
close the business, so we close the business. So would you say that for an entrepreneur, he, knows, he needs to know when it's the right time to yeah, make that change? I think so. I think one of the things, I mean, they always say, don't they, that you learn more from failure than you do from success, and, and that's certainly true in my case. One, one of the many things I learned, aside from not having more friends and, and, and partner and, uh, and so on, is, is um, giving yourself as a, as a, a, if you're starting a business, giving yourself a stop loss. At what stage do you not continue with the business? Is it a length of time, three years, five years, whatever, or is it the amount of money that you've sunk into the business? I never did that at the beginning. And it was always, well, this year's lost money, but I can see, I've done the budget, and I can see next year's going to make money. And next year never made money. Um, so I think one thing I would, I do now suggest to people is, I mean, you know, if you're starting up, give yourself a stop loss. But don't you, some people would argue that, you know, if you just go for another 10 minutes, you might just be there. You might. Yeah. But, um, yes, it's kind of a funny story. There's no right answer, is there? Um, but looking back, if I had given myself a stop loss, I wouldn't have said seven years and I'm going to tell you how, mu how much money. Uh, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have given it half that. So, anyway, I, you know, these, as I say, you learn a lot more from, from failure. And I can tell you, failure was very, very painful. You know, when you start a business and you're successful, um, you know, that gives you a lot of confidence in life. And the reverse is true. When you have a failure and you've let people down, or you feel you've let people down, no matter how hard you've tried, um, then, you know, you feel a failure in yourself. It took me a long time to recover from that. Um, but I did. Um, and uh, and you just get back onto the bandwagon, and and something else comes along. Really. So, and what did you do after? Well, I retrained. There wasn't anything that was bumping up against me saying "do me, do me." So, um, I retrained uh, as a strategy consultant, and uh, best thing I ever did. Um, I learned a lot of things about how to start businesses and run businesses that, that honestly, I've never I've, I've done most of it by the seat of my pants. I learned some proper ways of doing things, uh, and that will be great help going forward into um, into future businesses. So, from from training as a as a consultant, then I started a, a strategy consultancy, uh, which was just myself originally, and then myself and my wife. Yes, I made the same mistake again, um, and uh, but, but it was just it was actually, um, and then grew the business through uh, associates. So we had lots of associates uh, providing consultancy to, 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 to clients, um, and the business was taking a share of that, so, um, and that was fine. Um, and then it kind of grew sideways, because um, while I was at management consultancy clients, they, some of them needed funding, and I uh, worked for Beer & Partners, who were the largest business angel network in, uh, in Europe at the time, um, and so I, I was kind of doing both things at the same time. My consultancy clients needed funding, funding clients needed consultancy, so the two things worked hand in glove. Um, and the consultancy was around corporate strategy and marketing strategies, that's what I trained in. Um, and just at that time, the internet was growing very fast, um, and digital marketing as we know it today, internet marketing as we knew it back then, started to gather pace. And what started as our marketing division became uh, internet marketing division, became an internet marketing company, and eventually subsumed the whole business. And uh, in the end, uh, 20 years on, because the, the business we, uh, I said morphed these days, the, the term was pivoted, pivoted from a, from a management consultancy into a digital marketing agency. And um, by the end it was just digital marketing, we had no management consultancy at all, there was no funding, uh, and we had 50 staff doing SEO, paper click, social media, content marketing. Did you say 50? 50, yeah. 
um, based in Bristol, um, and uh, we sold out uh, three years ago uh, to a company called Fat Media. Uh, so Fat Media in Bristol uh, exists today, and that's, uh, that was my business. Um, um, and uh, that was kind of a 20-year 20, 20 journey, but uh, it changed a lot over that time. So in terms of your, what you've learned over the years, how long you got? If um, you know, if someone is, you know, uh, someone like perhaps like Steve, just you know, ha has an idea to start, and you know, it's what he wants to do, what would be your advice in that case? In that Many and several. Um, one, I do a plan. Two, I do a budget. And budgeting, do you know budgeting? You know, I was quite good at maths at school, but. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a finance man, but I found, I found in the last business I had that, that doing reg regular budgets and planning financially forward gave me a sense of control. Um, budgets weren't always right, but I, at least I planned and I knew what I was going to do financially and then I'd track it. And the, the more I did that, the more control I felt in. And it's, it's tricky, as an entrepreneur, you kind of don't want to feel in control, you want to go with the flow, there's a bit of that thing about being an entrepreneur. But actually, financial control, really, really essential. Um, and then, you, you know, even if, even if your budget says the worst and we're going to lose money, then you can put a strategy in, in, in place to try and, try and prepare against that. So, Number one, do a plan. Number two, do a budget. It would be my, my my very strong recommendations. Okay, in terms of the, you've thought your presence. In terms of going forwards, you know, okay. how do you see yourself, you know, developing even further, perhaps with other businesses? I mean, what, what's your plans for the future? Well, great fun. I mean, when I when I when I sold the business three and a bit years ago, um, I went from I went overnight from. Um, a desk piled high full of paper, hot telephone, and queue of people outside my office to 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 to, to see me. And I went from that to nothing overnight, um, and it was wonderful for for a time. Um, and I retired for three months, played a lot of cricket, well, then got extremely bored when the cricket season finished, um, and I had restrictions on me. I couldn't go into um, agency, I couldn't do digital marketing because of the sale restrictions. Um, so I, I did mentor um, and it was great. I, I really, really enjoyed it and enjoy it today. Um, so all, all pro bono but with um, Microsoft uh, Accelerator as it was in those days, uh, Microsoft for Startups as it's called today. Um, set Square in Bristol, which is the universe fabulous because, I, as I said earlier, I love playing with that Rubik's Cube of business, and that's exactly what you do as a mentor. Um, and, and, and different people want different things from a mentor. Some wanted just just the grey hairs, and you know, I've got a few of those, and each one of those is a mistake. Um, and the ones that I've lost, those are very big mistakes. Um, some of them want that, some of them want specific experience, like, you know, I've got some skills in marketing and, and uh, hopes to track the strategy, so some of them want that. So they all, all want something different. So, so you know, I, I, I've done a lot and, and found it thoroughly enjoyable. Um, I still do it to this day. Um, and, you know, I've taken on um, quite a few uh, board advisory positions. So as chairman um, uh, or as non-exec director, um, and that's excellent um, because you have you, you're doing a similar sort of thing. You're playing with a really skewed business, but it's real. It's not somebody else's business because you're involved. It's partly your business, um, but you're not day to day. Uh, I'm not sure. I've, you know, I've had six businesses. I'm not sure I've got one seven in me. Um, maybe never say never. But. Um, so, what do you get from that? What do we get from what, that? How do you feel by doing that? Well, I feel I'm contributing. I'm, I feel I'm helping, helping them, stopping them to make some of the mistakes that I've made. Um, just passing on some experience. Um, 
it's 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 very similar to, to, to mentoring in a, in a way, and yet different. Um, yes, and I, and I'd like to do more. You know, I'm, I'm you know, more than happy. And I've got some startup businesses and some scale-up businesses. Two things are very different. Starting up a business requires certain skills. Scaling up a business, slightly different skills. Um, and then I've got some family firms where that's you know they're, they're established businesses. So they're, they're all slightly different things that they need. Um, so I'm doing more and more of that as, as time goes on. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm working for the marketing centre, which, which provides part-time marketing directors to, to grow businesses. Um, so I do some, some work with that. Um, exactly what, what comes next, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm 109 already, so I'm not much <laughs> more <laughs> no, it's the you know it's your knowledge that counts. It's not the age, and you're not old. No, you know, was it forty-five? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. um, so um, because you know, bearing in mind our theme for tonight is blockchain as well. Do you see that there are many blockchain companies in Paris? No, see, blockchain is fabulous and, and, and so exciting. Blockchain and, and, and AI are the two things that get me. Yeah really excited today. So um, I'm reminded going back into the what the mid late nineties when the internet was was, was just starting. Um, and my my cricket business was uh, selling direct and, and you know we did many things wrong, but we were the first cricket equipment company with their own website in the world. Um, and and I thought it's wonderful this this internet it's going to change the way everybody does does business, and it did, of course, and still does to this day. And I'm reminded of that now, partly with blockchain, also with AI. But some of the things that we think of now as, as established and, and 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 the norm are going to change completely. Um, kind of think of um, examples uh, medical. Uh, I think is a good example. So, um, uh, for blockchain with, in the medical world, so we could we could have as individuals, we could all have control uh, of our own medical records through blockchain. Instead of it being the property of the, the doctors or the hospitals or the doctor writing the hospital or the hospital writing, and all that chaos. And oh dear, we've lost your your medical records. You know, that's, that's nonsense. You know, I mean, it's archaic. And you can imagine blockchain can take control of that, um, and it can give different levels of access to the people. It can be completely public. It can be partly private, partly public. So it has wonderful applications. And AI in that circumstance as well. I was reading something recently, I forget the exact numbers, for, 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 forgive me, but they were looking at triage. People coming in with medical complaints and, and triage. And, uh, I think the numbers were vaguely, um, if a nurse did triage, the success rate was, uh, was 65% and doctors was 75%, um, and, and AI was 85%. Um, and it's going to totally change the way in which you know, we, we, we all interface with, with, with the medical world. It's going to affect our lives and our health um, and how long we live. You can't get bigger than that. So, I, I, for me, AI and blockchain are the two, two absolute, absolute biggies. But do you feel that perhaps, uh, you know, as an example, NHS, it's more political than the technology behind that? Is, you know, people thinking that, oh, I don't know if it's got access to my file, or, you know, you know how they, how people get reassured if they don't even understand what the blockchain is, uh, which is safer, more secure. Yeah, and it is. It, it is a difficult. If you ask the man in the street what blockchain is, he, I, I haven't done it, but I, I don't think they would know. A lot of, of my friends don't know what blockchain is. Um, they think blockchain is Bitcoin, because. Bitcoin is a blockchain application, but it's not. It's not the same thing. But that's what they think. But that's but that's what they, what they think because because there isn't much knowledge about blockchain because it's marginally complicated. Um, if you try and explain in words one syllable what blockchain is, 
do people understand it? Well, some, some do and some don't. Um, I think it's much more important what are the applications of blockchain, because blockchain isn't very sexy. I think AI is sexy and it's scary all at the same time. Blockchain isn't very sexy, it has massive potential, but it's kind of at the boring end of, uh, of things. So people switch off quite, quite early when you start to explain it. Because if you talk about AI, and they go, oh, it's scary, you know, the computer's going to take over the world, and you know, we're all going to be slaves to the computer, and, 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 and the human race is dead. You know, they can, they can understand it at that level, but they can't. If, I think it's more difficult for people to understand, you know, sort of the blockchain applications. And is, is blockchain going to be, as, is it going to be the next internet? I don't know. I, I think it's too early to say, isn't it? Well, there are some um, startups, interesting startups. For example, Law, uh, which, you know, they actually perform better than a lawyer. Um, depending on what, well, <laughs> <laughs> not all those, of course. Not all those. <laughs> <laughs> At least some test pilots, you know, depending on what it is, of course. Um, but yes, AI blockchain is a, quite a big. Um, if you know, if everything you know, that means that the data will never be lost. Yes. It will never be stolen. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't get any more secure than that. So. Yeah. So, so and, and you know, I just work for a cyber security company. You know, security is 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 in all our minds, isn't it? Um, of data, of money. You know, security is is is, is the big thing. So if it if it just does that, then then I think it has the bit to do a bit more than that, isn't it? Um, that in itself, I think, would be would, would be wonderful. Especially with money, it's also such a sensitive issue where you know no one can do anything without being involved. Because you know that's a chain of computers that we talk for all yeah, right now. Absolutely. Um, but um, in terms of personal journey, um, how do you see yourself in ten years' time? Is it more companies, more experience, more different technologies? I I, I, different technologies certainly. No matter how old you are, I think you're either a, you've either got a techie piece in your head or you haven't. And, and, and I was kind of born with that, and I've always been. Um, fascinated by the new technology and excited by it, um, rarely scared, but always excited by it. So I'm as, as excited today as I say about AI and blockchain as I was with, with, with the internet. So I expect I'll be doing something in 10 years' time with, with one or both of those. Um, I know my son's already involved in AI, um, so, so maybe we'll be, be, be happy to it. You know. Sure. Do you think you can work with your son? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I already work with him. I'm, I'm um, to run Slush Rewards, which is a, a, a restaurant uh, reward um, app. Um, so I'm, I'm chairman of his advisory board. Because he's my son, yeah. then half the time he doesn't listen to me at all. <laughs> um, I have to remind him I'm his chairman, and then, then he sometimes listens. Um, uh, uh, you know, he's very, very clever. He's cleverer than me. So it doesn't need much, much help or advice from the other thing. Well, you're being modest, I'm sure you does. <laughs> um, so in terms of, I, I didn't mean it like that. I meant, you know, that, um, you know, a son always, you know, maybe he's not going to show it, but he always listens to his dad. <laughs> um, I'm speaking for personal experience. <laughs> um, so um, we kind of touched um, blockchain, you get a kind of a brief overview on your background. Is there anything you, any advice, any tips you would like to share with us in terms of your business experience, how entrepreneurs could cope with different situations? Is there anything which, you know, uh, would I you think, like to say? To well, I, I, I think today, I mean, it's, I think it's fabulous for entrepreneurs. There's so much support mechanism out there through uh, incubators and accelerators and mentors and you know, there's lots and lots of startup advice, lots of scale-up advice. There's lots of help and, and support. And back in the day, um, you know, you know, entrepreneurs like me had, had very little support, and you made probably more mistakes than, than maybe they will make, make today. Um, so I, I would encourage anybody um, in startup or scale-up land to, to draw to join. Um, an incubator or an accelerator and, and use those facilities. You know, some of them have free 
uh, free accommodation, most of them have free training, lots of them have mentors, some of them have access to finance, use that. You know, it's, it's, it's there um, and, and uh, it's fabulous, so, so use it as much as you can. And would you say, just to kind of uh, touch it briefly, is it more the entrepreneurial, the idea that people, especially investors, look for? Yeah. So what is that they are actually looking for? Uh, you know, if an entrepreneur hasn't failed at all before, um, or, you know, the idea, but he doesn't have the right development tools, uh, or self-development tools. You know, what is that? You know, I'm sure there's a bit of luck as well in the market. Oh, there's a lot of luck, lots of luck involved. But um, the question is, what what sort of investment? Yes, I mean, what's the ideal scenario that you can say? Well, this entrepreneur has a better chance of succeeding than the other one because he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. You know, what would you know? What would would be an ideal from your perspective? It's a blend, isn't it? You need the entrepreneur to have passion and to have enthusiasm and to have belief in his product or service or idea. Um, investors will generally invest in, in one entrepreneur, they'll invest in a team, and they'll invest in the team uh, because of the quality of, of, of what they have. And they're investing in the team not so much as the idea, but the ability to deliver the idea. That's not the execution. It's more, ideas are, Ten a penny. Being able to deliver an idea is so. The old adage is better to have a, a, an ordinary idea but the ability to deliver than to have a you know an earth shattering idea. Give me an example. Um, so I was mentor um, at uh, Prince Andrew's Picture Palace, and they did a road show in um, in Cambridge, and the people I was allocated to mentor had the most wonderful medical application. Um, uh, in, in the way in which we're, 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 we're all going to, to die a horrible death uh, from lots of the, the drugs that we use uh, being overused. Um, and they, they had wonderful sticky stuff that made um, uh, ordinary drugs today work forever in a day. And it's a billion dollar industry. Billions and billions. I said that to them, this is, this is, this is, this is earth shattering, this is billions, they said, oh yes. They didn't get through the first round because they didn't have the ability to stand up on stage and present themselves and present their idea. They muttered and, and, and you know, the slides were a mess and, you know, I, I had no time to work with them or, or, or I would have suggested they completely redo them. So there is the most wonderful idea, but they, they couldn't even get past stage one. So it's not about the idea, it's about the quality of the team, the ability to deliver, and perhaps the ability to present the idea to investors, to, um, to, to other people who might get involved. And if you can't do that, you're not going to get off the starting blocks. But then do you think that there are some people which they are? Fantastic salesman. Yes. But they haven't got any good ideas. Yes. And then that's when you know the other side of the coin is. Absolutely. And, and obviously it's a blend. Um, and you kind of need both. But if you ask, if you ask investors what they invest in, they invest in people before the idea. And I think it's mainly around the people's ability to to deliver. Um, and I, I, I'm amazed to this day that you know you see pitch decks from entrepreneurs, and it doesn't actually say how they're going to do it. They say it's a wonderful idea, it's the market, we take this percent of the market, we will make this many millions, and here's the graph, and uh, and everybody gets excited and so on. They don't. I haven't seen many. Um, it's horrible generalisation, but I haven't seen many who have actually got a business plan that says right. So there's one more opportunity, but this is how we're going to do it. This is a granular level, how we're going to make this happen, and make this money. And this is our detailed financial forecast, and this is the thinking behind the forecast, and so on. Um, 
maybe that, maybe that's a bit old school, but um, I suppose that comes with experience as well. If people have done that before or they failed before, that they understand that better. But if it's you know uh, you know someone twenty year old just left university, doesn't quite twenty year olds don't have a fear of failure, do they? Maybe, 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 oh, which no. is and, and, and rightly so, I didn't. And, and when you fail once, you learn through many lessons. Um, and you might not say it out loud, but you say it to yourself in your brain at, at 3.59 a.m. And you say, that's never going to happen again. And you get, you know, what doesn't break you makes you stronger. Um, you get an inner steel. Um, and you learn, to, you learn to budget tighter, plan more. Um, and it's not very sexy to say that stuff, but actually, that's what works. Well, in my experience. Yeah.